Hi, and welcome to this episode of Cybersecurity Inside. I'm Camille Moorhart, and you have your other co-host here, Tom Garrison. We are really happy to be here today with these special episodes of Live from the Green Room, where we are grabbing people out of the middle of the Intel AI Everywhere conference to chat with them in a little bit more detail about what it is they do and what they're interested in and anything else we're curious about. Right now, we have Amitai Armon with us. He is actually chief data scientist for Intel's internal AI group. Welcome, Amitai. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to meet you. I'm wondering if you can kick us off by just explaining what is a what is the role of a chief data scientist for an internal AI group as opposed to what might be an external AI group? Sure, I'll start by explaining what the group does. So uh, we are a group of over 200 people who use artificial intelligence methods for Intel. Right, so AI is uh, becoming very popular uh, recently, right? Uh, all those models that crunch data and make predictions, uh, but it is mainly used in uh, consumer software, uh, right? In various uh, uh, games and uh, various things that we have in uh, Google and Facebook, right? Uh, but uh, what we do is different. We use AI in an industrial setting. We use uh, models that make the machines in the factory smarter, for example. Instead of manufacturing each processor the same way, they learn what happened to the processor during the manufacturing and personalize the manufacturing of each processor. And we don't just make the machine smarter, we also make the factory smarter. So instead of treating all the machines the same way, they treat them based on what happened to them in the manufacturing so far. And not only the machines and, and factories become smarter, the processors are also smarter. Instead of behaving the same way in every computer, they adapt themselves to the usage in the computer. So what we do is using AI methods to make Intel's products and manufacturing uh, better, more efficient, more useful for our customers. That's the focus of our group. That uh, there's so I have like 10 questions <laughs> queued up after that. Um, so let me start with maybe more of a mundane one. So you're you're the chief data scientist. You got a PhD. Yeah. Are you are you focusing your personal time, not not Intel generally, but you do you focus your time on building the models or are you focused in some other area of, of AI? That's a great question. So uh, about a third of our group is data scientists. Uh, the other two thirds are split between developers or machine learning engineers, people and, and product people. So the data scientists focus on building the models, the AI models. The machine learning engineers or developers are people who, who build the platforms around the models. Uh, right, uh, the whatever brings the data, checks the data, uh, monitors the model when it's in production, deploys it, they handle this. And we have the product people who engage with our internal customers, learn their needs and uh, try to uh, manage the projects and make sure that they work correctly. As the chief data scientist, I, I, I wear several hats. One of them is that I'm professionally responsible for all the data scientists in the group. So it means that starting from the hiring process, uh, through their trainings, uh, advising their projects and uh, any publication and patents. So uh, I need to make sure that the hiring process is fine and that we are the right people, we do the right trainings. And so I, this is one part, the, the horizontal responsibility for all the data scientists. Another thing is managing a smaller team that focuses on AI innovation using cutting edge methods to innovate and uh, solve new challenges and uh, enable breakthroughs in, our, uh, in solving our business problems. And uh, a third thing uh, is uh, promoting AI uh, across Intel and also uh, externally in the ecosystem. Uh, so uh, what you mentioned, uh, the, A, uh, the AI uh, Everywhere conference that we now have at Intel is a part of that ac these activities of promoting AI across Intel. Uh, at the same week, we also had an external conference, AI Week, which we co-founded with K Tel Aviv University, uh, which is uh, something which is done for the Israeli ecosystem mainly, 
promoting AI and industry and academy relations. So uh, we do a lot both inside Intel and externally. Is there like a single quality that you look for in a data scientist? You, you know, you're obviously responsible for hiring, as you mentioned, but is there something that you look for that maybe people wouldn't think of? Obviously prowess in building models, but is there something else that you look for? Uh, I, uh, as you say, the basic thing is, uh, is passion for, for data science and modeling and data in general. Uh, but the second question is usually whether the, pe the person is uh, passionate about building products or about publishing papers. Because many people in our domain, uh, you know, they were educated in academia, they have master's degrees or PhDs, and then they feel that publishing a paper is, you know, the, the, the top achievement. And uh, we need people who want to build products. And sometimes we do publish papers in top conferences about our, our products. And I also review for uh, conferences like New Ips or ICLR or ICML, the leading conferences in the field. But this is not our focus. That's the, the, side, uh, the side effect, sort of. Uh, so uh, I think that you know, we need uh, talented researchers who can do the, the, uh, the technological breakthroughs, but uh, adapt them to reality, to not try to just publish a paper. I would say there are dozens of thousands of papers published in AI uh, every, uh, every year. Not many people manage to uh, create an impact of $10 million or $100 million using AI. And our group altogether uh, brings an impact of over a billion dollars every year to Intel. So, you know, I, I, I feel that it's more, uh, more of a challenge and more, more impressive, more satisfying for me than just publishing a paper in a conference. You know, I, I can't let you get away because I, I have so many questions about AI and specifically since you're a chief data scientist, I, I just have to ask this question. And so this is a generic question and sorry, it's going to be kind of a long winded question, but I'll get to it in the, at the end. So for example, in the, in the hospital setting, uh, AI is being used to be able to, to detect things like breast cancer way earlier than uh, uh, the human eye has been able to detect it. Um, and, and it gets me thinking like, how from a data perspective, do you <clears throat> sift through you know, the moral equivalent of this picture that has all kinds of data points all over it and narrow down to the things that actually matter in a way that probably is counterintuitive to the human being, right? That's why, that's why in the hospital setting, they can find these cancers sooner because I guess, you know, they're, they, they've been able to, uh, to sift through the data in a way that was counterintuitive to the radiologist. But how, how, just in a generic setting, how, how does a data scientist with AI uh, take the, the myriad of data that exists out there and, and figure out how to do something with it? That's a great question. Uh, sometimes it's like magic, you know. Uh, but, it feels uh, like magic uh, to me. That's why uh, <laughs> you can't go without me asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, actually, AI works differently uh, than humans. Uh, the way that AI learns is different. And uh, I, uh, in the hospital setting that you mentioned, usually AI is able to support the uh, the, the physicians and the uh, uh, bring them uh, value in uh, pointing out suspicious uh, x-rays and so on. But I don't think that AI is already capable of uh, replacing them in uh, deciphering uh, x-rays. And it, it will still take a significant amount uh, of time until uh, AI reaches that level. We're not you know, just approaching it in a few years or something like that. It's, it's, still, uh, it's still difficult. The human brain still works. Uh, learns in a more sophisticated way than AI systems uh, learn. Uh, the advantage of AI systems is mainly that uh, they have the, um, the scale or the amount of working memory for processing a large amount of data and uh, traversing many potential uh, options for uh, processing the data. I think for example, on a game of chess or Go, you can traverse many, many paths, right? You can 
uh, check many options with AI. And uh, you know, you can give an AI system a million examples of uh, X-rays, each with some uh, labeling of whether it was uh, bad or not. And the system is able to learn from it. Uh, so uh, that's that's the advantage. Uh, the advantage of humans is that uh, they are uh, uh, better in uh, in assessing a, in what we call a zero shot learning. They have a lot of prior knowledge about the world that they studied in advance. So now they don't need a million examples, right? They they cannot process a million examples, but they also don't need them. They can learn just from uh, five examples that you have in a textbook about how the, the bad X-ray would look like. And they just understand from that, uh, just from the few uh, uh, examples that they are shown. So I think that uh, AI in a sense complements people in, uh, in, in what it is able to do. And uh, in Intel, we believe that AI empowers uh, people, people who use AI are able to do more and focus on what they are good at and what they like to do, not on the tedious things that AI does better, but on the things that we have advantage in. It almost sounds like humans extrapolate from very few examples or from the framework that they've put together by living. And, you know, computers are more like processing or interpreting or, you know, distilling down from so much information. Right, right. Uh, humans uh, think, for example, about the baby, right? So how does the baby learn? The baby hardly interacts with the world, right? It doesn't do a lot of actions that, uh, that uh, create, that do things and uh, have some results. You know, it's just starting to, to move. And, uh, and, and uh, he doesn't get uh, millions of examples, right? He didn't uh, read all of Wikipedia or all of the, the internet text, which is required for uh, language models like GPT-3, if you heard about it, right? He didn't read all of that, but still uh, he is able to, to grasp language and start talking, right? Uh, so uh, how does this happen? So uh, people who practice AI call this self-supervised learning. Instead of learning, from uh, supervised examples in which you have answers to, to questions or you, you have samples with labels, you just learn from the data itself without uh, any uh, labels. And you, you, find it, you find the labeling, the answers in the data, right, uh, kind of. So I'm not sure if I'm able to uh, explain it in full, but uh, the, the bottom line is that humans still have a learning mechanism which is uh, far better uh, than the learning mechanism of neural networks or other AI models. The human learning mechanism evolved over a billion years of evolution. Uh, the last steps that distinguish us from, uh, from uh, other primates is probably just a few million years, but still it took a long time to evolve it. And still we, we don't understand how humans learn and the AI learns in a much less efficient way but it still has uh, some advantages. So it's better in chess or go, but it's not as good in many of the daily tasks that we need to solve. So what do you, what do you see as the future, uh, you know, in your world? You're, you, you, you understand kind of obviously what Intel's doing, maybe the state of the industry in, I don't know, three, five years. What do you think the future looks like? Yeah, so uh, I've just asked that uh, in the conference uh, that you mentioned uh, everywhere, I uh, interviewed uh, Professor uh, Jan Lekun, who is considered one of the AI godfathers. He uh, is the chief AI uh, scientist of Facebook, Meta, and also a Turing Award winner for 2018. He, he uh, back in the 80s, he invented what banks used to read checks, right? So he's really mm. uh, one of the of the godfathers of AI. And I asked him, uh, you know, what does he think will be the future? Is AI going to uh, uh, replay, to be able to do anything that humans do? And uh, he said that uh, it will take probably several decades until this happens. Uh, I, I'm uh, more skeptic than him uh, because mm. I, I think that there are some inherent things that AI, uh, would, would not be uh, able to do the same as humans, right? Uh, the robots will not love their children too, right? 
Uh, the robot will not, will not be hungry, they will not uh, fear death, right? There will be differences between uh, humans and robots in, in emotions, in understanding other humans, in communicating with other humans. So I think uh, uh, AI is going to continue uh, evolving, uh, continue to solve uh, specific tasks uh, better than humans, but we are not close to having a general intelligence which is able to do uh, everything that humans do and even better than that. Uh, we were just uh, going to improve the specific tasks and I think that it's important for, for us as a society to see how to best leverage these increasingly better tasks that AI does for social good purposes, right? I think it's important to, uh, for uh, people to be educated about AI, right? It's all around us, right? It's, it's approving our credit transactions. It's, it's uh, decides what we see on the net, right? On the web. So it's, it's important for people to know more about it. I just published today uh, an article about it in one of the Israeli newspapers about the importance of doing more in uh, education for AI. Intel has some initiatives around that in high schools and universities, but I think there should be uh, more. And once we understand it better, I think that people will also be able to uh, increase the uh, usage of AI for social good purposes, like medicine, like uh, other uh, science or other social good purposes. And again, we have several activities like that in Intel as well, and we do lots of volunteering, but uh, I, I think uh, that more can be done by society in general, and uh, we should learn more to do more for the uh, good of mankind. Well, I can't, I, I want to ask you about distributed and federated and local learning versus central learning, but now I'm just stuck on, if, if you're gonna do social good, who's defining what is good for society? And are you letting the machine decide that or does that remain always a human decision? Uh, that's a good question. Currently, the humans, they make these decisions. So we feel that, you know, volunteering for hospitals is a good thing. So we as humans volunteer and uh, we lend our uh, talent to the hospitals and just develop AI, AI models for them, right? And when COVID started, for example, we volunteered for Israel's largest hospital, the Sheba Medical Center. And later on, they gave us uh, a nice recognition for that. And, you know, uh, that for the Intel team that, uh, that helped them in predicting the deterioration of uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, and uh, so currently uh, it's, it's humans who think what's social good. I don't think we are close to the time where uh, machines uh, will uh, rule the world or uh, do all of these things themselves. And I'll just quote what uh, Jan Lekun, Professor Jan Lekun told me a couple of days ago in the interview. He said, the smartest people I know don't, know, don't want to rule the world. They don't want to conquer the world. So the smartest machines, smartest machines will probably also have no desire to conquer the world. They will just play chess or play Go and, you know, just solve what was they were trained for. We, we shouldn't be afraid of those apocalyptic scenarios of uh, the robots waking up and uh, conquering us. So no Skynet. You heard it here. <laughs> That's what he um, said. So, I asked him. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I guess my 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 question, my last question here, just has to do with um, a little bit more about the future. But but like, what's stopping us from going even faster? What what is the limit for 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 p the pace of innovation with AI? I think that one key limit is uh, is that we don't have enough AI uh, professionals, right? Uh, people. More people uh, should study AI. It's not a compulsory course, even in computer science uh, degrees in universities, in many universities. So this is, uh, this is one thing. Uh, the other thing is compute. Of, of course, compute is progressing and there are bigger and bigger uh, models and bigger, bigger computers, but you know, it's still uh, an obstacle. And the third thing is just, it takes time to, uh, to understand the, the secrets of nature. How, how, does, how should learning really work? Now AI tries to imitate neural networks, but maybe it's similar to the mechanism of the way we see things, but it's probably still very different from the way we reason or uh, you know, do some more, uh, some deeper uh, logical uh, thinking. Uh, so it, it just takes time for science to evolve. I'm not sure we can uh, do this just in one year if we invest more, so it takes time.
Do you feel like when you're working with AI, you're working with a tool or you're working with a machine or a, um, you know, a tactic, an algorithm, or do you feel like it's its own entity and you're learning, you're trying to figure out how it's working and how it's achieving, you know, its results also? No, no, I don't think it's a, its own entity. We understand the models that we build. Uh, it's not uh, its not a black uh, box uh, mm -hmm. for us. And also most of what we do at, at Intel, most of the models are just machine to machine, right? We don't uh, handle uh, data of people. We just, you know, tell the machines how to treat the processors or tell the factories how to treat the machines. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, Currently, AI is comprehensible to data scientists, at least. So we understand what we do at this stage. At this stage, maybe later on it will become too complicated for us as well. Well, uh, Amitai Arman, thank you so much for letting us grab you away from this AI Everywhere conference and AI Week conference that you've also been involved in. It's been really fascinating hearing from the chief data scientist for. Intel's internal AI division. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. A pleasure.